Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 17, 2013, and this is the week in charts. Jeez, you know, I say this every week, but this week I swear I really mean it. We have so much to cover. So I'm going to go ahead and get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement of their delicious drink. And Red Bull saw that was too fat, so looks like uh, finding an energy drink to support me and uh, endorse in my endorsement. It's not going to happen. We shorted Monster a while back, so they don't like me. They were killing too many people, so I guess I can't drink that. Oh, good stuff. All right, there is the disclaimer screen. Let me give you the short version. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Do me a favor. Throw me a bone. If you read my book, and of course you like it, and I can't imagine you'd be here today if you didn't, put me up a review on Amazon.com. Um, let's get through housekeeping quickly as we normally do. Excuse me while I get organized here. I'm missing my little pad. Um couple things. The uh, volume two, as I mentioned last week, is now ready of uh, these week of charts. And my um, the feedback has been really, really good, especially on volume one. And volume two has just gotten out there, and a lot of people haven't gotten to see it yet. But in general, uh, I'm very excited about the feedback that I've gotten on these um, webinar recordings. And as you know, I put a lot into them, and I think um, I think one of the, you know, I don't want to talk too much and be too vain about it, but one of the great things that, that happens is um, a lot of times, and, and, and you get the credit for this, you you, you, um, you draw me out on some concepts, and as one person told me, he's like, Dave, when you're trying to directly tell me something, I don't get as much out of that as when you go off on your rants and you begin to um, just talk about markets and concepts in general. So I want to thank you for uh, all the positive feedback on that. If you're interested in those, uh, see my website for more information. But um, again, the feedback's been really good on them, so I'm very proud of it. You know, you put your work out there and you're not sure what's going to happen, and, and, and uh, it's very exciting when you get positive feedback or something like that. So I'm not being vain, I'm just telling you what's going on. Um, my first two books are still available. Today we're kind of going to go back to the future a little bit, cover some of those concepts. As you know, um, Sometimes, uh, you know, as I said before, okay, thank you, Stephen. I uh, wasn't aware of that. Um, if ever, you know, Stephen saying my market in a minute isn't current, but if, if ever that happens, just go to my website and uh, use the YouTube YouTube version. Uh, first two books are still relevant. I still use some of the concepts from those. If you want them both, let me know. I'll cut you a good deal on that. What else is going on? I think that's enough. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh working on the um, housekeeping there. Uh, today we're going to cover some advanced concepts. Now, if you're newer to trading, don't worry. I'm still a trend-following moron, okay? That's still an uptrend. That's still a downtrend. And this is still a sideways trend or no trend whatsoever. Actually, that's slightly positive. Let's just make this more level, I guess. That's sideways, okay? So don't worry about that. But what happens in this industry, if you survive long enough, you begin to see a lot of things and learn a lot of things. And some of the things you learn are a little bit outside of your core methodology. You want to find a core methodology. You want to try to stick to it. And you don't want to try to trade everything at all times. But there are certain concepts you will learn that can help in your trading or at least help make some decisions. Maybe it will help you to know that, well, this market is overbought based on this dynamic. Maybe I better hold off on buying it at this juncture. Um, or this. Uh, when I say market, it could also be an individual stock. The stock is overbought based on this dynamic. It's pretty close to my tr profit target. Uh, might not be a bad idea to take profits somewhere around this area. It also helps to know things such as the market has been quiet lately. So what does that mean? Does that mean it's going to continue to be quiet? Eh, no, it's probably going to have some sort of expansion and volatility. So these concepts are useful to know. 
you're not going to use them every day, but it is helpful to know some of these things. And it's a little bit more advanced than just the basic uh, trend following that I'm such a big fan of and use on a daily basis. And we'll flesh all that out in just a second. So we talk a little bit about FIB extensions, volatility ratios, and the VIX. And uh, last minute, I got an email about uh, following your trading plan. So a little trader psychology be thrown in today. Um, you know, it's like every week I think about what I want to cover. And I keep telling myself, uh, self, oh, I just kicked my, just got up and kicked my cord out. I hope I didn't, uh, I hope we still have sound. Yeah, it looks like it's still good. I tell myself, you know what? I mean, it's, it's probably about time to get into some more trader psychology. And usually the trader psychology just sort of comes up in general through um, throughout these presentations. But um, so be prepared. I'll probably be doing a, um, a presentation at some point in the near future on trader psychology. Uh, I, I think I, it's it's one of my favorite subjects uh, when it comes to, to trading because it's we're all fighting this battle within, and I think it's very important to get a grip on things. I'm getting a little um, further ahead of myself than I intended, so let's get let's just get back to the um, to the concepts, the technical concepts that I want to cover. Uh, if you have the second book, you know about the gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper is simply a pattern where a market has a sharp retracement, kind of like a V-shaped recovery, and that's how that, that all dovetails into uh, current market conditions, and this is why I'm talking about these things. By the way, um, I'm talking pattern today versus trend, and if you go back in and watch the webcast that I did going back a few weeks ago, I also talked about pattern versus trend, and sometimes you might have a short-term trend in one direction, but there might also be some patterns that are working against it, okay? So let's say, for instance, you have a double top. Well, the right side of that double top might st might be an uptrend. So let's say you have, you know, market doing a double top. Say it's doing like this, okay? And it looks like it might be a double top. Well, that would be the pattern, okay? The trend would probably or could easily still be up but you have a pattern. So sometimes you have a pattern versus trend. Uh, sometimes the market may be losing momentum but still be in a longer term uptrend. And that's where, let's say, market does this and starts losing some momentum and begins to roll over. Well, longer term, the arrow still points up. But shorter term, you could have something like a bow tie forming or some sort of transitional pattern, okay? So that's where you get into pattern versus trend. And that's why when we're talking about something like a transitional pattern where the market's just beginning to roll over and you're looking to play that first little pullback, something like that, that's why it's kind of dangerous, as I talk about it before uh, or throughout the book, uh, Layman's Guide, you, you'll, I'll say things uh, when I talk about the transitional patterns, that you're a bit of a pioneer trade because you could be fighting what could be just a correction to longer term trade and that market could go on to make new highs because the trend is in place, okay? So that's a little bit about pattern versus trend. Sometimes you have a stock pattern, again, like a double top, where psychologically people think, oh, well, it looks like it's going to new highs, and it doesn't, and they get trapped on that. They don't, or they fail to bail out at the prior high in here. There's some sort of psychological basis behind these patterns. So one of the patterns is the gatekeeper, and that's just where you have a sharper trace, but it stalls short of the prior highs and then rolls over, okay? Now, one thing that I notice with the gatekeeper is, let's say it gets past the gatekeeper, and if you look at my book, I've got the little man here. He's like holding down the, uh, oops, looks like I made a, <laughs> definitely was a man there, wow. <laughs> uh, might have to edit that out, PG-13, uh, right? But if it gets past where the gatekeeper is, the little man holding down the fort there, sometimes it shoots up and then it becomes very overbought, stalls out around a 127, okay, and then begins to roll over. And all that's going to make a lot more sense in a minute. And um, I had a really cool example for you, but it's become a moving target and doesn't look like it's going to work. But I think it's worth showing nonetheless. And if anything, it's a lesson that, hey, not everything works, right? See, there's always a lesson and I always have an excuse, right? Anyway, in 10 best, the question posed to me was, if 786 is the gatekeeper, what happens 
where the market gets through the gate, breaks through that level. And the answer is that uh, I noticed that it will often break out to do highs and sometimes stall at the 127. Um, retracement would thrust down. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense unless you're looking at an actual chart. So a gatekeeper is a V-shaped type of recovery after a sharp sell-off that stalls out between 61 and 78 percent round numbers of the prior high. So this is straight, the, all the, everything in black here, uh, with the exception of this up here, if I can get my pen to work, uh, is just straight from, uh, this is a screen capture from Dave Landry's 10 Best. But you can see that this market had a sharp sell-off and then began to retrace. Now you want to have that V-shaped look to it or reverse check mark look to it and it'll stall out or often stall out somewhere between 618, 786 retracement. So this is a pattern that I've seen time and time again and looking at a lot of charts. Sometimes I'll be long this market, okay, and then uh, it'll stall out right around there, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes you're lucky enough to be able to take profit before that happens, and sometimes you're not. You know, you just try your stop higher if you are long and you get stopped out. So be it. It is what it is. Uh, but what I'm talking about is when you get past that 786, sometimes the market will have a fairly quick run up to the 127. Now, if you measure this, if you measure from A to B, 100% retracement would be right here. So whatever this leg down is, let's say this is 10 points down. If it goes up 10 points, then this, you have this V-shaped recovery, and it's 100% retracement. So 100% would be right here. If it goes another 27%, which is a Fibonacci number, then you would have that 1, 2, 7 percent retracement. Now let's look at a real example here. This is the RSP and I use this um, for tracking purposes. It's an unweighted index and the reason I use it is because I manage these uh, momentum list. If I see a stock that's trending really nicely and I like it, I'll put it in a watch list. And in more recent times, over the past couple of years or so, I've started actually tracking those momentum lists for performance. Okay, and I'm, and um, and very recently, I've uh, developed a variety of different lists that I'm working on as part of my ongoing research. But the great thing is, this is an unweighted index. So my the way the telechart sets up your um, your your lists or their lists, I should say, however you want to look at it. Is they're unweighted. So if you put in 10 stocks, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, let's say you put in 10 stocks, well, it's going to give each stock a 10% weighted, weighting, okay? Uh, if you're looking at something like the Q's, it's an unweighted index. Apple at one point was 20 something percent. They scaled it back to about 12%. It rallied back up. And I'm not sure exactly what percentage it is now. If you get bored, you can Google that and find out. But it is a moving target. Um, but what this will do is it'll allocate 10% to each one of these uh, positions, so to speak. And I have the Landry 100, which I track, so it allocates 1%. So it's an equal weighted index. You don't have one or two big issues that have the majority of the weighting and then a bunch of other issues where it doesn't really matter whether they move or not. So it's kind of cool every now and then to look at an equal weighted index like the RSP. And uh, what's fascinating about it is it's up here at all-time highs, okay, in spite of the market being hovering near its prior highs in here. But keeping with the theme of this little retracement we talked about, if you do the math on this and you subtract, let's just see if it's in here. Nope. Uh, if you subtract the high from the low, okay, and that comes out to 442. So if you subtract uh, this number from this number, it's a uh, 442, like the old Oldsmobile. Anybody remember those? What was it? Uh, 400, four barrel. I forget the, what the two means. But anyway, uh, it's 442, and then you multiply that times uh, 1.27, okay? Because obviously if it rallied up a 442, it would be 100%, so we're doing 127, and that comes to 5540. That was fascinating, is two days ago, the market stopped precisely 
it closed at 55.40, the, w, the RSP that is. So I found that kind of interesting. So this is an area to look for a market to be. It's just sort of a measurement of overbought. It's a measurement of where a bar, market might reverse. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say that because it's some sort of Fibonacci number. It has some sort of magic to it. But once a market makes a V-shaped recovery like that, okay, uh, look for some sort of stalling action around a 172. Doesn't mean that if you're long that market, you should bail out, but maybe you might want to be um, cautious around that level. Okay, two wheel. The two is a two wheel drive positive track. Very good, very good. Got some car guys in here, John. Good, uh, good point on that. That's what the 442 is. Four barrels, 400. What was it? Four on the floor. I forget. Oh well. Anyway, 442. Oldsmobile. Um, so 55.40 is a 127. Now we overshot that this morning a little bit, and we'll take a look at the um, we'll take a look at what happens there. And just for fun, let's just pull it up real quick. RSP. I'm just curious. Um, nope, I did. It came. It's still so far trailing. But anyway, it's just a little trick or tip that you should know of. Don't try to short a market when it gets up to the 127. But if you are along that market and it's a logical place where you have plenty of profits at that level, then it might be a good place to take a little profits and it might be a good time to be a little cautious. Any questions on the uh, 127? Uh, what's the math on times? Okay, 127. Okay. Uh, it's 127% of this leg down. So if you take this leg here, which we said was 442, 442, oops, okay. So the math would be 5421 minus 4979, okay, which is this leg here from there to there, okay. And that gives you 442. My pen will work, okay. So if you rally back 442, that would be 100%. So we're multiplying that times 1.27, which equals, what does that equal? 516, I think. Whatever that math is, I think I wrote it down somewhere. It looks like it's 516. Okay, so if you add 516 oops, to this, you're going to get 5540. And I think the math is right on that. I had meant to write all the math over here, but I got sidetracked right before the show with some last minute uh, emails, okay? So again, as I said earlier, when it gets past the 786, sometimes it rallies up, it hits that 127 and rolls over. And by the way, that's the uh, what Derek Hobbs calls a, a shark attack. I call it a shark bite uh, pattern, okay? I'm not a fan of reversal patterns, but every now and then I'll come across something that's kind of interesting and if this market were to reverse at that level. It kind of looks like a shark taking a bite out of the market, okay? Um, conceptually, I don't know why this happens other than the market is just overbought and due to have a little bit of a correction. Again, I'm not a reversal player, but every now and then if you see some sort of reversal pattern, you can factor it into your trading. I would Don't try to trade everything because if you try to trade reversal patterns, you try to trade trend, you're going to get all mixed up with what you do and you're going to get analysis paralysis and end up uh, in a lot of trouble. Hey Jason, no problem. I want to make sure everybody's on board, especially when I'm covering more uh, complex uh, concepts like today. Okay. Now, I want to talk about what happens at a low volatility situation. And it's not rocket science, okay? Traders don't agree for long, so you get a market you know, doing whatever, moving around quite a bit, okay? And then what happens is it starts to do this. That means that traders agree upon price. But what you have to remember is traders don't agree for long. And when this does happen, let's say you get a, a low volatility situation after markets have just been kind of all over the place. Let's just do this again. Okay. 
So again, traders don't agree for long. So it, volatility begins to dry up. And you'll see the volatility. Let's say this is your volatility reading over here. The volatility will begin to dry up and kind of flatten out and get really kind of low in the market. Usually what happens when it begins to dry up and you get a low volatility reading, you get an expansion in volatility. You don't need a reading. You could just eyeball the charts. In fact, I didn't put the reading on the chart today until I was putting my slides together, and I didn't even remember how I did it. I had to go back and think, well, i got to do this indicator. How do I make this indicator show on my screen? So I'm not watching this indicator every day. What I am watching is this. In the market, if I see the market begin to tighten up in that volatility, in other words, let's say the market, this, let's say this is price doing this, okay, and you see price begin to do this, begin to tighten up, then you know that it's due to start doing more of this, okay, and conversely is true too, which we'll look at in just one second. And the thing I want to tell you about today is when you do see things compress like this, I can get my pen to work, okay, watch for a fake out because what will happen is sometimes you'll get that big up move, and then all of a sudden, it'll come right back in, okay? And the converse is true, too. And as I've said before, uh, sometimes I call it the base breakout fake out, okay? Wait for a market to break out of a base, and then look to go long the opposite side of that, or look to go short, in this particular case here, the opposite side of that. So just know that you also have a lot of f uh, fake outs. The other thing, it, too, is a market can become really complacent. And I think that lately... Our market has been become really complacent, and you could judge that by looking at something like the VIX. Now, keep in mind that historical volatility, and I talked a lot about historical volatility in the first book, so go in and read that if you have time. And basically, it's a statistical measurement of how much price has moved over a given period of time. And in theory... And in theory, be the key word in that sentence. A market, based on its historical volatility, and you're assuming a normal distribution, and we all know that markets aren't normally distributed, and assuming all things constant, and we know that th constants are constantly changing, right? That's the only thing we can predict about the market is that it's constantly changing. But if you make all those assumptions, you could factor this formula into a bell curve and know that a market would be X percent higher or X percent lower a year from now based on that volatility. So that's what historical volatility is. Right now, the P's have an HV of around 13. So all things constant, the market has a two-thirds chance of being 13 percent higher or 13 percent lower a year from now. Now, before you write me, it's not quite that simple, but if you can get your, wrap your head around that, that's close enough, okay? Because here's the deal, by the time you pick it all apart, markets aren't statistically distributed anyway. If they were, then a statistician, or the statistician with the biggest computer, I guess I should say, would own the markets. The markets or made up of a bunch of emotional little participants just like you and me. We're going to talk about trading psychology in just one minute. But just know that HV is a measurement, historical volatility, is a measurement of volatility. By the way, notice the word historical in there, okay? That's where the all things constant, blah, 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 markets aren't normally distributed, et cetera, comes into play. So it is looking backwards at the market. It's still a very useful indicator though because, and I hate to use the word indicator, maybe a statistical measurement might be a better thing, but it does help you. If you're looking at a stock that has an HV of 100, you know that that stock has moved around a lot in the past and will likely move a lot around a lot in the future. What's interesting about volatility is that it has some uh, interesting characteristics it tends to compress and it tends to expand. After an expansion in volatility, you tend to see a compression in volatility. After extreme expansion in volatility, you usually see a market bottom. Markets normally bottom on high volatility. They often top on, on low volatility too. 
But what I want to talk about today, not the fact that they could be topping it here, but the fact that volatility has dried up. Now, you could use some other dynamics, too. You could just kind of draw some lines in here and see that, well, wait a minute, this market hasn't gone anywhere in quite a while. And the other thing that bothers me, too, just by the way, I don't want to get too sidetracked, is, but notice that we had that one-day wonder rally on the um, fiscal cliff. Oh, everything is great in the world. And then what happened to market <laughs> has just gone sideways since. But I don't want to digress too far. But you can see this is the volatility ratio. And what I'm doing here, it's a formula that goes on for about a mile because of uh, TC doesn't have um, – a very robust programming language, which is fine because I like it. It's quick and dirty. It works for me, right? But I take a six-day HV, and I divide that by the, in this particular case, the 50-day HV. And if you want the formula, I'll give it to you. The metal stack formula is only like one little line, which I also have somewhere around here. Or you could, you could Google it and get it just as easy as, uh, as I could. By the time I fire up metal stack and dig it out, you could have Googled it. Anyway, I digress. What happens is when a market gets very low in volatility, it tends to have a big move one way or the other. The question is which way? Well, um, I don't know. But the thing to realize is often you'll have that first move is a false move. So in this particular case, it looks like we might be getting a little expansion of volatility to the upside. Although it will be interesting, if we close flat on a the day, then this volatility will actually continue to control. Uh, Contract. Remember, we're not measuring range, we're just measuring closes, okay? And if you just look at the closes, look at that close, look at that close, look at that close, look at that close, look at that close. Look how flat that is. That market is due to make a move, and maybe we'll see that move today. It looks like it's trying to move, trying to do something today, right? So, but you can look at this measurement here, this HV, and again, I don't plot this every day. I have to, it takes me a while to plot it because I've got to remember how to plot it. But it can be useful to tell you when the market's due to move or you just look at the market. So the, the lesson to know is that just be careful. Sometimes that volatility expands. It just keeps on going. But often that first move is a false move. So when you see a low volatility situation, be really careful. What's fascinating is the VIX is at very, very, very low levels in here. Now, I'm not a, a huge fan of looking at absolute levels and saying, oh, if it's less than 15 or more than 15 or less than 10 or more than 10 or whatever the case may be. But in this particular case, we're down here at multi, multi-year lows, I think 10-year lows or something. And, you know, when it starts getting that low on a relative basis, I would begin to worry. I wouldn't worry so much about the absolute um, basis, the number over here. But where it is relative is important, and, and often, it, it, years ago, I did the research. I worked with uh, Larry for a while, and I come up with some own systems, too, based on it. And, and um, Larry had said something about, you know, VIX reverting to the mean, and the mean being like a moving average. So I took the movie, I took the word mean, and I took it literally, and mean being an average, and I did some uh, work with him on some systems and come up with some modifications on his systems uh, on the, move, on the uh, VIX. I don't use the VIX. I don't want to say anymore because here we are looking at it today, but I don't use it as much as I used to. I found that volatility did dry up for a long time, and these VIX systems didn't work. It's like, well, Dave, why are you looking at the VIX? Well, it only matters when it matters. It's sort of like the intermarket technical analysis and some of these other concepts in technical analysis. They only really matter, at least in more recent times when they matter, which means that if you have some sort of relationship with a dollar versus stocks, they might be some sort of relationship longer term that works, but it could, they could diverge for long periods of time. And this intermarket technical analysis only matters when it matters. When the focus is on the dollar, then yes, keep an eye on the dollar relative to stocks, okay? But when the market doesn't seem to care about the dollar, then don't worry about the dollar, okay? So I find the same holds true for the VIX. But now, with it way, 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 way down here, it's suggesting a market that's very, very complacent. Um, as a general statement, 
You want to be sellers of volatility at high levels, and you want to be buyers of volatility at low levels, okay? So you certainly don't want to sell volatility when it's way down here because this could happen to you, right? Your risk to reward is just abysmal. You can have this huge move higher in the volatility. And another way of looking at the VIX, again, you know, this is why I get the what be worry is it's a very, it measures complacency. Now, when the VIX gets all excited and you see a huge spike in it, this is the VIX down here, and this is the uh, S&P future, I'm sorry, the S&P cash up top. And notice that you had a big spike in it, which correspond with June lows, okay? Market begins to sell off high, our hard VIX uh, spikes up. You can see you get a spike back here to VIX, and you get a bottom in the overall market. When the volatility begins to dry up, okay, the market gets kind of complacent, okay, that's when you often get a top in the market. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't run out and short with two fists, which I think is still on the domain, www.shortswith2fists.com. <laughs> Uh, but I would be concerned about the fact that this mortgage is just kind of wedging higher in here and not really following through for this big old announcement day, okay? And then volatility is dried up in here. So be careful. And that's one reason that I'm liking these issues, which I'm going to talk about in just a few seconds, a few minutes, that could trade contra to the overall market. Because I think the market's a little overbought in here. We haven't seen a whole lot of follow through. And it just seems like a little too it's a little too complacent. Okay. Any questions on the VIX, volatility, retracements, or anything we covered so far? I'll be happy to rehash all that. If not, I'll move on. My big concern, and this is why I'm bringing up the 127 retracement and all this other stuff, is that it's often hard for a, mount, a market to mount a new leg on top of an old one. You have these V-shaped recoveries, and it's like by the time the market gets all the way back to its old highs, it begins to get a little tired, and that's where you get a possible double top in the works, okay? So in order for a market to continue to rally from an overbought condition, it has to become even more overbought, or technically, a more technical term would be super-duper overbought, okay? And this is a graphic that I've been uh, showing you for the past three or four weeks in here. Just has me a little concerned that this market ran up to its prior highs in here, okay? And now what? So it's hard for it to do a new leg on top of a no leg. A market can do whatever it wants, okay? Trust me, I work every day. I work really hard trying to figure out what markets are going to do, okay? And I haven't figured it out yet. And you probably never will either. But you could come up with a workable plan around what you learn about markets, okay? And hopefully you learn a lot from me because I certainly learn a lot from you. All right, uh, any questions about anything so far? No, nope, quite a bunch today. Good, educated bunch, fantastic. Um, you know, most of my comments today are the same that, as they have been lately. Conditions are improving, and we're going to look at some sectors in a minute, but you got foods, especially the brewers, my favorite, uh, which are making new highs in here, although I'm kind of watching carbs lately, so it's like all that beer I have in the garage is uh, just sitting there. Uh, maybe I need more friends. I digress. But uh, <laughs> foods, brewers are doing well, uh, financials, banks, quite a few areas, transports at or near new highs in here. We're going to look at all those in just a few minutes. So conditions continue to improve. My concern, again, is that we had that one huge update from this fiscal cliff BS. And by the way, I don't get into fundamentals, and I try to avoid the news, but obviously you have to live in the rock to not know about the fiscal cliff thing. What fascinates me is it's not a positive development, but it's a less negative development. Okay, It's like, we're not going to raise. We're going to raise taxes, but not as much. I don't know what that creates for the markets. That's something that I have a hard time wrapping my head around. Okay, but the market goes up. I don't care. 
Uh, as I said last week, we're still in a stock picker's market. I'm going to show you the type of patterns I like at this juncture. Okay. Um, I often like to match the pattern to the market, and uh, that's one way of doing things. So if we're bottoming out and the market's beginning to rally off of major lows, like we did in 2009 or 2003, then I'm looking for those stocks that are bottoming out and rallying off of major lows. Now, you're probably thinking, but Dave, right now you're looking at some stocks coming off major lows. Well, the reason I'm doing that is because I think those stocks, and those stocks are more speculative stocks, I think those stocks could trade contra to the overall market. Um, IPOs, these low-level speculative stocks, and uh, you know stocks like that, stocks would maybe promise, such as the Solars, promise for the future, right? They can trade independently of the overall market, like the one we looked at last couple of weeks, SPWR, went up about 50% in one day because of the excitement in that stock, whereas the market itself uh, has been kind of flat, as you know, as of late. And that stock has the potential to move a tremendous amount more than the overall market. Okay, so those are the kind of stocks I like at this particular juncture. I also like the stocks that are at high levels that, that are just beginning to roll over because if we turn out to have a bit of a double top in this overall market, then those stocks, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And I'm going to flesh that out in one second. Okay. What else? Okay, that's good for that. Let me just show you some examples of those. Okay. Wilmer says, what about individual volatility with a logarithmic scale? What about individual volatility with the logarithmic? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, individual stocks, volatility individual stocks, a single stock. Okay. Um, well, I don't know that you need to use a logarithmic scale uh, with it because you're not, I mean, how far... Volatility is something that I don't. I wouldn't look back. I wouldn't look back a long, long time, years and years and years and years with volatility in a stock because obviously, an internet stock probably had a much bigger volatility in 1999 than it does today as a more mature company. So I'm not sure why you would want to use a, a logarithmic scale. Maybe you could explain that to me, and then um, we could agree or agree to disagree. All right, let me just show you a couple of stocks, type of stocks I like. Last week I showed you this one, and I blacked everything out because it was an it was actual setup of the service, and it has since triggered. And let me show you why I liked it. And so far it really hasn't worked out for us, but it made an all-time high here, okay? And this is right after making an all-time high here. But notice back here you can see the trend is definitely up. And notice here, it's making new highs, so the trend's still up, but it's only marginally higher here than it is here, okay? So the sideways trend is, for the most part, pretty much sideways. So it's lost some steam, and now it's begun to sell off and pull back. It also made a bow tie, so it's a first thrust and a bow tie. Now, if this thing begins to sell off fairly hard, just keep in mind, anybody who bought during this consolidation is going to look to get out at break even when that market begins to rally back up, or stock, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So I think that this stock is in a lot of trouble. I think it's topped out. And two reasons why I like these stocks at high levels on the short side. One, it's, it's the relative strength uh, anomaly. If the overall market rolls over, then the bigger they are, the harder they fall with relative strength, high relative strength stocks, okay? If the overall market begins to rally, then sometimes these high relative strength stocks become a source of funds. So it's a little dangerous when the market is kind of at this uh, V-shaped high level recovery to go after some of the stronger stocks. It's a little counterintuitive, but ideally you do want some sort of trigger to let you know. This doesn't mean that, let's say, the overall market's doing this, and then you know, the question mark is, is it going to keep rallying from that level, these high levels? 
It doesn't mean that you want to go out and short a stock that looks like that, but if you see a stock that's looking like this, that was a previous high flyer, then maybe this might be worth a shot, okay? If the market begins to sell off, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. If the market continues to rally, then this could become a source of funds for a stock at low levels, and that's another reason why I like stocks at low levels at this juncture, okay? Now, here's a stock, uh, in case you're wondering what it was. WPI. I like to throw out some real-time things here and there just so we see what happens. It did sell off and it's pulled back a little bit so far and it hasn't really worked out just yet but I still think the stock is in a lot of trouble. So I like the stocks at high levels that are beginning to roll over. Uh, on the short side you can see this is a very speculative stock. This is what I call a Phoenix type of stock. It's gone down here and it's made this long low-level base. Ideally I wish this base was two or three years long but hey you can't always get what you want. And it's rallied up and since pulled back, kind of cup and handle looking on a big picture. This, this, so this looks like the mother of all bottoms. And I think that stocks like this, we, we used the example of SPWR last week, the week before, uh, very speculative, very dangerous, but have the potential to move A, number one, very big in a very big way. And uh, number two, can possibly move contra to the overall market. And here's one more example of this. Notice that this stock has come down here and made this low, 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 low level and it's rallied up and has since pulled back. Okay, this stock was way up here, three or four hundred percent higher and now it's going down here and made this low, low level base. Okay, so I think that this stock also has potential. We'll see what happens. Okay. Any questions or anything covered so far? The type of stocks I like at this juncture and why? Um, if we get in the rip-roaring bull market, and hey, today's market's up. You know, who knows? It might start following through. Where the market thrusts, pullbacks, thrusts, pullbacks, does that pullback, pullback? Begins to do that over and over, rinse and repeat. Then I'm going to be more excited about trading these longer-term trend resumption type of patterns. Right now, I'm a little bit more concerned about the overall market. And, and right now, um, I, I, you know, one thing that I'm, um, the reason that I'm not as excited about these bigger cap stocks that are in longer term trends is because they're going to trade a lot more like the overall market. They're going to have a beta similar to the market, okay? They're going to be a little bit lower in beta or whatever, the higher in beta, forget, no, lower in beta is the concept. I just call them, you know, big cap, small cap, volatility. When I talk about stocks, I don't really use the word beta too much. So I get a little tripped up, but they're going to be—they're going to act a lot like the overall market. So, for instance, uh, Bank of America (BAC) was set up recently. It was a good-looking setup, but I didn't take it because eh, the market's at these high levels. It could be a little questionable, and you're almost trying to predict the overall market when you're buying a stock, a big cap stock like that that has been rallying. Also, okay, so. I think market direction is a little tough at this juncture. It's not obvious. It's not cut and dry. You could make an argument for a variety of uh, ways. You could say, well, you know, market's been headed higher, and it has, but you could also point out that it's overbought, and it is, and it's also nearing or just past its prior little highs in here. So I think stock getting the direction of the overall market is a little tough at this juncture. By the way, it's harder to predict the overall market than it is to go through several thousand stocks and find some sort of inefficiency and in stocks that can move bigger than the market. Okay, it's it's much easier to find an inefficient stock that can move than to predict the market movement overall. The overall market tends to be choppy. You get a lot of hedgers. You get uh, speculators, you get fund managers, you get analysts. They're all fighting it out in the overall market, whereas if you find um, a relatively low capitalization stock that has been trending or it's making a major reversal like the ones I've seen, chances of, of, of that inefficiency working are better than longer-term uh, prediction of the uh, overall market. Okay. All right, uh, got a little um, last-minute psychology uh, question in. And as I've said before, and as I wrote in layman's, 
whenever I work with someone, which I, I haven't really done much lately, but I just threw the, the emails, which I do for free, but I haven't officially worked with anyone in a long time. I've kind of, uh, I haven't just done that in a while. Um, but when I have in the past, I'm always like, geez, how am I going to fix this guy? And how am I going to figure out what's going on? And one or two things happen almost invariably. Uh, one, I ask them what they're doing wrong, and they tell me flat out. It makes my job pretty easy. Don't do that. Or number two, they give me their trading records, and I pour through them, and usually it's blatant, and it just jumps right out at me. And my favorite examples, this was happened many years ago, but one guy had about 20 trades at one stock, and the rest of the trades were trade straight from my service. Now, truth be told, it wasn't a great period in my service. It was somewhat mediocre at best. But he told me that he couldn't make any money, and I was working with him one-on-one. -on -one, and I looked at his records, and I said, well, you know, Joe, we'll just call him Joe, if you take out those 20 trades you made, which appear to be day trades, you would have been profitable over this several-month period, whatever it was. Now, you would not have set the world on fire, but instead of looking at that several thousand dollar loss, you'd, you'd be in the black by a little bit of money, several hundred dollars in the black, which that's a pretty decent swing if you think about it. That's a lot of money, right? And his answer was, I know, I know. So, which brings me to a Livermore quote, which is straight from layman's. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. Everyone raise your hand, and I've got both of mine raised right now. Do you ever do something you're not supposed to do and know you're not supposed to do it, but you do it anyway? Yes, we're all guilty of that. Okay. Now, Kwai Chang Kang, I hope I got that right. Anybody remember uh, Kung Fu? I never did watch the series, I'd watch the opening scene or two, and but I'd, I'd get bored after that. I was a little younger when that series was out. Um, but uh, Kwai Chang Kane used to wander around the American West. He was an American guy playing an Oriental guy. They were supposed to have uh, Bruce Lee play the role, which would have been pretty cool. But uh, I think it ended up being David Cassidy. David Cassidy, is that his name? Is he, didn't he die recently? Some bizarre accident. Anyway, he would wander around the American West, so he had no plan. So, and this week's lesson of you know what you're doing wrong is trade with a plan. Right before the show, I get an email that says, I've been guilty. Hey, Dave, I've been guilty of inconsistent haphazard trading. You know what you're doing wrong. Well, what are you doing wrong? I'm guilty of inconsistent haphazard trading. Looking at my book, I keep thoughts and records in and realizing that I'm not very consistent in what I'm looking for in the market to take a trade or manage a trade. First of all, you need a plan. You're going to need a methodology. You're going to need a money management system. And you're going to need a, um, the psychology to follow that plan. You're going to need to understand the nuances of the methodology, which are going to help you to follow that plan. I can go on and on and on. And that's why in Trader Psychology, in layman's, I wrote, it's your mind, it's the methodology, or it's the market. Wait, that's wrong. It's your mind, money management, or the methodology. And then subsets of those could be the market, I guess. So if you understand your methodology and you hit a flat period and you're not making much money, you say, well, wait a minute, I don't need to get depressed. I don't have to. I don't need to. I don't have to do anything crazy. This is just part of the methodology. And, oh, I noticed the market is choppy. Uh, maybe you need to back off a little bit. If you're risking a small amount on each trade, then each particular trade doesn't mean a whole lot to you. And you have 
the ability to do the right thing, okay? And then obviously you have to control your emotions. But if you get the money management and the methodology part right, and you do some mechanical things like planning your trade, your life's going to get a lot easier. So he went on to say, going back through your book again, the psychological checklist on page 102, 103, plus page 109, plan a trade, trade a plan, post-mortem. I'm coming up short. No actual written plan to follow. Journal is lacking. Methodology, nothing. Then I've written only scribbled notes from your chart shows. Few plan trade notes or analysis. So if you're going to go into a trade, again, it's cliche, but plan your trade and trade your plan. Know what you're going to do. Know where you're going to get out. Know where, or should say take partial profits. Know where that stop, or at least initial stop, is going to be. Have a rough idea on how you're going to trail it. We talked about some of these games before. And the reason I say games is it makes the psychological aspects much easier if you're playing some sort of these games in the market. And one of the games I call Keep the Change. Okay, let's say we're trading a higher price stock. In the 20s or 30s or 40s or whatever, and it rallies up a little bit. Let's say it rallies up, I don't know, 35 cents. I'll say keep the change, meaning that I'm not going to bump my stop up 35 cents. And by doing that, I'm able to widen out that stop and stick with possibly a position longer term and ride out some longer term corrections. So uh, have a general plan and say, okay, I'm going to trail a stop, I don't know, five points away from the price, assuming you're, it's a higher price stock. And stick to that plan. And then when you vary from that plan, make sure you have some sort of reasoning or something that makes sense from a psychological and a market kind of basis, like I just said, to keep the change type of game. Okay. Uh, how do you get consistent? Well, that's where, it, you know, money management, money management, money management. And as I wrote layman's, money management will cure a multitude of sins. So if you're only trading at a small size, then each position doesn't mean a whole lot to you, okay? And it's not going to affect your lifestyle, and it's not going to stress you out. But if you start trading at a size that can materially infect, infect? Yeah, it can infect, infect, infect your lifestyle, then you're in a lot of trouble. And then it's going to be very hard to do the right thing. So without going on, I mean, too late, right? Without going on and on, if you know your methodology, if you know the ins and outs of it, and the other thing too is important, you also have to live through a few market cycles, good times and bad times, right? But if you know your methodology and if you practice proper money management, then the mind part becomes easy, okay? You just follow the system and you follow your plan. And like I wrote in the book, do you even have a plan? Okay, so to circle back around, you know what you're doing wrong. What are you doing wrong? Well, I know. I don't have a plan. My job's pretty easy. You can pay me a lot of money. I'll be, you know, give me a lot of money. I'll work with you. It'll take a lot of money at this juncture because, you know, I got things to do. I'm a busy guy. I've got a lot of projects going on. So it's going to cost you. But you can save yourself a lot of money and just ask yourself, hey, what am I doing wrong? And many times I think you're going to find that answer. Okay? David Carradine, he died in one of those erotic strangulation deals. Yeah. He, uh, yep. He's no longer with us. Quan Kane Chain. Okay. Kane, whatever his name was in the thing. All right. Let's get through RST, L, and E. Lately, that's just been Apple. Everybody's obsessed with Apple. I made a bold prediction last week, and I'll stick with it. There's a little canary in the coal mine. I think this is the funniest thing ever. Nobody, Nobody's laughed at that, but I just think that's hilarious. So, uh, Anyway, uh, last week we talked about Apple, and I said uh, 340 with a little stop around 400. Okay, And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, it's since broken down. I said 340 if we broke 500, okay? And it's notice it's rallied back up. So it's broken support. It's still in a downtrend. If you short, stay short, okay? 
but it remains at a downtrend. I think uh, it's going to stop around 400 on its way to at least 340. But I also said it's going to be a choppy ride. Apple's a very efficient stock. A lot of analysts are going to look at the earnings and look at this and all these dynamics, and they tend to fight fight it out. Okay, so it's going to be a choppy ride. But that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Apple remaining in a downtrend, and you're wondering where I get that. It would be the um, around the um, bottom of this little range here, top of this range here. It's about 350, 340 round numbers. Okay, with a little stop around 400. All right, now. Thank you, Eric. Someone, someone like my little Apple picture. <laughs> I'm just so. Uh, my wife off. The, you know, when we first got married. My wife just thought I was the funniest guy ever, and we knew this couple, and and he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known. And and he'll crack, uh, he'll crack some jokes and say some some things. Real dry sense of humor. And his wife's always like, "Don't laugh at him. He's not that funny." It's like. <laughs> You know, it's like it's like, but he is, and now, now I'm, now we're kind of that couple. <laughs> you know, my wife's like, don't encourage him. <laughs> so that's okay. I still make a laugh sometimes. All right, let's get into the markets. Uh, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do that. Uh, first of all, I want to cover the overall market. I want to cover a few sectors, and then we'll uh, start looking at uh, some individual stocks in here. Uh, Let's see. Let's take a look at the P's, and let's look at the micro, and let's look at the macro. Micro, hey, this is very good. Break it out to new highs. As I said, ad nauseum over the last hour or however long I've been talking, pontificating. Um, low volatility situation have gone sideways. No follow through from this fiscal cliff BS we had here. Now beginning to break out to new highs. That's a good thing. That's fantastic. I hope it goes up forever. Okay. Only thing is, I would caution you is be careful because very overbought in here. And keep in mind, and you probably know this, but markets seldom do a perfect double top. You know, getting back to pattern versus trend. Okay. Getting back to pattern, they either stall short of the overtop and roll double top and roll over, kind of gatekeeper fashion, like this. Okay. Or they overshoot it like this, okay? Kind of like in that shark bite thing I talked about, the 127 deal, okay? But rarely do you have a market that's going to stop right at that prior high here if it's going to roll over at that level. Now, hopefully, it'll just keep on going. I would remain cautious in this market just because it's so overbought. And it still has what I call a wedging look to it. I like markets that rally up and then correct downward and then rally up again, okay, rinse and repeat. I don't like markets that rally up and then just kind of do this little wedge action higher like we've done here in the P's. But so far, so good. I'm not going to argue with new highs, okay, and the markets make it do highs today. So, so far, so good in the overall market. But just be careful for all those reasons I mentioned recently. Uh, namely, it's overbought and it's a V-shaped recovery at high levels, okay? Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ has that big picture retrace look to it still, but it is pushing above it, although it's losing a little bit of steam today, or intraday, I should say. But it is pushing above it. We've got time. Let's take a look at the intraday chart, just for S&Gs. Let's see what's going on. Wait for it. There it goes. Yeah, you can see intraday. It's kind of lost a little steam from where we started. Gapped higher, rallied up. Okay. But it still has a big picture retrace look to it. Also overbought, also dangerous to buy into the overall market. And this is why, again, not to beat a dead horse, but why I'm liking those individual issues so much uh, on, as opposed to the overall market at this juncture. And that's why I'm looking to short the market and go long the market, meaning that I'm looking to buy stocks and sell shorts and stocks. Okay? As I often say, I hope I'm wrong on the shorts and make a lot of money on my longs, right? But sometimes you have to play the hand that's dealt. And right now, for now, I think we still play both sides. Okay. Uh, financials are up here at brand new highs. Multi-year, not all time, but multi-year highs. Better than poking the eye. Okay. Uh, banks, insurance, doing okay. Insurance up near new highs. Um, transports, a lot of excitement about the transports. So far, so good. 
Uh, very persistent move higher in the transports. Those who follow Dow theory, follow the transports, they get very excited about um, the fact that the transports are getting are making new highs. I don't get that excited about Dow theory, but I certainly put this in the positive column when making a case for the overall market. So this is certainly a good thing. Yes, the market's overbought, but look at the transports. Transports are doing pretty good in here. They're going up, okay? So, so far, so good. Bases the transports. Let's take a look at uh, shorter term bonds, or, or let's take a look at the 10 year bond. This is IEF. Uh, wide and loose, but in general, it looks like it's in trouble. Okay, it's going to have a lot of support. I was bearish on the TLT for quite a long time, and I guess I still am. I was bearish after this leg down here. And I didn't recommend it as a direct short simply because it's just such a bumpy ride and it's an overanalyzed market. If it sets up perfectly, I'll short it. But when it's kind of, um, you know, not a perfect setup in here, but just looks toppy, I won't. Okay. But anytime you're trading something like bonds, it's going to be a choppy ride uh, and, and hard to hold on to that trend. What else is going on? Um, again, you know, I like these areas like aluminium. Although there's not much uh, as far as setups there just yet, but I like these stocks like aluminium for two reasons. One, it's a metal, and metals, as you know, can trade contrary to the overall market. And number two, um, I like the fact that they've bottomed out in here and look like they have a longer ways to rally. You know, the, the, what concerns me is these stocks that are at high levels up here. You know, what's left in the rally is the big question, whereas some of these low-level stocks, I could see that they have a long ways to go, possibly, if a new market, uh, bull market begins to uh, mount. Uh, foods up near new highs, the aforementioned uh, brewers also at new highs, and what else is going on in sector action? A lot of these foreign shares at or near new highs, the stocks, S-T-O-X-X, 50, I think there's a bigger one out there that's also at or near new highs. Um, so a lot of stocks, a lot of Asian markets at or near new highs. I think the Nikkei's at new highs, Hong Kong's new highs. So a lot of these world indices are doing fairly well in here. So that's another piece of the puzzle. It looks uh, pretty good. My only problem as I talk over and over again about these foreign indices is that if we begin to correct in earnest, then so will they. They will, our market in there, and there, those markets will move uh, in tandem. All right, uh, I think that's enough. So as a general statement, things are still looking pretty good. Uh, just be careful out there because the market is overbought. All right, we've got some questions on some individual stocks coming in. Badoo, Badoo is kind of all over the place. And... Um, I don't see anything worthwhile trading with Badoo. What is this? Is that is that a split? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, it's just all over the place. Shorter term, it looks like it's trying to go higher. Longer term, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. For the most part, it's electrocardiogram in more recent years. So I would avoid this stock. But short term, Fed to make a short term prediction. Yeah, maybe a swing trade in here. But I don't know. I would totally. I just avoid it. I would. It's not worth trading. You could find something better than that out there. Okay, MTR. That's gonna be a very speculative stock. I like this stock. Um, I've been watching it. I, I wish this base here were down here at like 2009 lows. But hey, you can't always get what you want. Super speculative, but it's based. It's a uh, pullback. I think that's in the Landry list, so I should not have brought it up. Uh, but, yeah, I like it. Very good. High five. And that's the kind of stock I like in this market. Now, notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days uh, in the pullback. Uh, one would think this market would have taken off, or the stock, I should say, would have taken off by now. So if it doesn't take off soon, you might want to just forget about it because it might just be going back into that longer term base mode that it's been in for a while. But I do like it and I have to agree with you on that one. Celgene, C E L G, C E L G. Uh this one is going straight up, just kind of melted straight up. And it's but it's also kind of lost some steam in here. You can see it just really has it it went straight up for a while, kinda of lost some steam. 
This would have to make a pretty serious correction for me to get excited about it. It would have to correct very deeply, and I don't think it will let me draw it in. But for me to get excited about this stock, it, it would again, it would have to have a very, very deep correction. These high flyers right now are kind of priced for perfection. I think it could be dangerous. So with avoid them, Alexander, that stock is on my list for today. So uh, high five to you. Uh, but no, I cannot talk about it. But yes, the answer is yes. Okay, QIHU. This looks pretty good. Um, this stock has caught my eye a little bit. It's kind of all over the place. Okay, and it's a look. It's a lot more volatile than this HV would suggest. Um, it's a fairly new issue, I think. Yeah, it's a fairly new issue. Looks a little cleaner when you look at a longer term chart, doesn't it? Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna give that one an okay. It broke out. It has a bit of a double top knockout look to it. It broke out of this uh, base. It's your first pullback after a base breakout. So I'm going to say, yeah, it looks pretty good, Wilmer. Good eye on that one. P-E-I for Alexander. P-E-I. Yeah, this one looks good. It's a little thinner. It's also a, a low in volatility stock because it's a real estate stock, okay? Longer term, I'm not crazy about the pattern. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's kind of wide and loose. Shorter term, I hear you. It's broken out, but it really hasn't broken out by that much. It's broken out a little bit and just kind of pulled back a little bit. I'm going to give it an okay, but not great. I think you can probably find better than that out there, but it's okay. Let's take a look at CP for John. CP for John. That looks pretty good. Um, Pullbacks, I'm sorry, uh, transports, as you know, have been doing really well. Uh, railroads within the transports doing fairly well in here. Nice little breakout from this uh, little base and little tiny base here. On a pullback, though, so it's got to pull back. So check back with me after it pull back, pulls back, and we'll talk about it. KRO for Alexander, KRO. Yeah, it looks pretty good, uh, except that what jumps out at me is it's got some bad memories to it, okay? And it can be a little wide and loose. So I would pass based on those two things. Uh, this is going to have some overhead supply here. I mean, I hear you. If you're just looking at if you're just looking at this right here, it rallied up. It's pulled back, although it's quite a few days in that pullback. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, I hear you. Maybe for a swing trade and only a swing trade, but it's got some bad memories. I prefer to get into something that can possibly uh, rally for a long time. All right, Howard says, RNF, long earlier today. Pullback was below five prior days. Bar with a stop below today's low. Looking for resumption of uptrend. New highs, first pullback from first move up in three-month base. All right, that's a mouthful. RNF. Uh, why would you already be long this stock, okay? I'm not sure why you would already be long this stock. It looks good. It's a good-looking stock. Okay, ad chemicals have been doing pretty good, fairly well, I should say. Uh, you can see there's the ad chemicals. This is a green line in the background, looking pretty good. So, yeah, that looks good, and this looks good. But why would you already be long? Because you haven't, you didn't get a trigger. If you're trading the TKO, your entry would be there. If you're trading a pullback, using today, assuming you're using today's prices, then you probably want to at least give it an entry, oh, I don't know, I'd say even maybe a size 30, 46 or so, okay? So if you're trading a textbook TKO, which it's sort of textbook in nature, your entry would be here and your protective stock will be there. Why would you have already bought the stock, okay? But I hear you. It looks good. So see, Howard's got that aspect of the methodology figured out. He can find good-looking stocks. But... I guess, and I'm picking on you, Howard, so stop me, uh, but I guess he's thinking, oh, uh, it looks so good, I, I don't want to be left behind, I better just hop in. And his answer is it rounded the H15 minute chart. Well, if, if you're a day trader and you're trading off of a 15 minute chart, then by all means, knock yourself out, okay, which I don't see, I don't see it there. Maybe talk about hourly? If that's how you trade, and that's how you consistently trade, even on an hourly chart, I don't see any reason to be long this stock. 
But if that's how you trade off an intraday chart then, and backing it with longer term charts, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think you're better off trading a plan that's a little bit more hands off and see maybe that's something else that we're finding out that uh, that Howard may be doing wrong is maybe he's looking at that he's looking at those uh, trees and he's not seeing the forest okay it's like yeah the the big picture trend is in place but wait until you get that confirmation on the daily chart instead of trying to get in early on the uh, five minute or ten minute or hourly chart now here's the deal if we get in a rip roaring bull market then by all means, knock yourself out. Get in as early as possible on everything, okay? But don't try to get in early in this particular market. If anything, err on the on the side of being a little bit too late. Let's take a look at IRE. That's going to be uh, Irish Republican Bank or something. Uh, yeah, you know, this stock is looking really good in here. I like the fact that it's made this huge base in here. This is one that's on uh, some of my momentum lists. It hasn't given you really a chance to get on just yet, though. So wait for a correction, and in light of this melt-up, wait for a pretty serious correction there, okay? Okay. TSL. TSL. Okay. Uh, I'm still bullish on these solar stocks. So TSL is not one of my favorites because it has a lot of bad memories to it, a lot of overhead resistance, okay? Uh, but I hear you in that it's rallied up. It's made this major, major low. It's come back from the dead. It's got a bit of that Phoenix feel to it. Um, I like the SPWR. The reason I like this one is it didn't have as many bad memories. A little further back, and they were further away. And then so far, it's blasted through them. Uh, but, yeah, I think you can do a little better than that in the Solus. EXP. EXP. Uh, that looks pretty good. It's it's uh, these M and C stocks, or especially something like cement, a price for perfection up here at these uh, major highs. So that's the only problem with that. I'd like a little bit deeper pullback in this particular situation, maybe to below 60 or right around 60. Uh, but it's not bad. I can't argue with it that it is in a trend. I can't argue that it's not in a trend. I should say um, it's not bad, but it, I, it needs a little bit more. Pull back. Any suitable symbol to trade on aluminum? Uh, I can't tell you those straight out, John. They'll, uh, you have to check my Landry list for that. Should I buy some VXX as cheap production for a long portfolio uh, since it's been beaten down so much? Boy, that's a tough question. And my quick answer is yes. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, you know, the problem with something like this is it's so it's such a derivative type of investment that it's um it has what appears to be a very bad decay problem to it, okay? But I hear you and then that that it seems like buying the VIX at this level would be a good idea even though you're kind of bottom fishing, but I hear you. And I think I was looking at the X, the X, Y, or something like that. So it got, this is outside of the method, methodology. And every now and then I'll do something a little bit outside of the next methodology. But don't do it as your bread and butter. Do it as just sort of a S and G type of trade. But I hear you. It's getting so low in here. You have to think about the um, the reversion to the mean and. I don't have the best vehicle to use just yet, or I haven't figured it out. And if you guys want to discuss it with me um, off uh, off air, we could certainly do this. But yeah, now's the time. I think you want to be buying up volatility. You certainly don't want to be selling it. I don't have the best vehicle for that. As a quick answer to your question, you know, should you buy the VXX directly? I don't know. Should you buy volatility at this juncture? Yes, uh, Stephen, I agree with you on that. Now, he's saying, like, uh, for a long portfolio uh, to help uh, mitigate the damage to the market rollover. Well, you know, that's the problem with that is you start end up ending up with a lot of moving parts, okay? Uh, maybe do it as a standalone trade, as a throwaway trade, something you could just um, buy it and forget about it, and maybe the market explodes or something happens. Or implodes, whatever, and it takes off. You know, it takes profits when that occurs. Uh, otherwise, just sit on it and wait. But it, um, the only problem is it's going to rot a little bit. Some of these, uh, some of these 
type of ETFs have a really bad um, decay problem to them. That's the only thing that's got me concerned about this. And as you can see, it's just kind of rotted here for a long, long time. Um, and you know, can it can it get to its old glory? Can it shoot back up? You know, I don't know. You might need to find a better vehicle. Study the uh, and if you do, let me know. Study those VIX indices, uh, those VIX ETFs, and, and see if you could find one that you think might be worthwhile. Um, I threw one of them in a in a uh, hypothetical portfolio that I track just for S and Gs to see what would happen. Um, but for that sort of similar reason, okay. All right, Steven. Yeah, let me know. And, and if you don't mind, I'll share it with everybody. Okay. Uh, but yeah, oh yeah, throw away trade, knock yourself out. You know, I'm, I'm okay with that as long as you're not trying to make uh, your your bread and butter. Okay, we got uh, Alex. We covered that one. Q Q Q Q U, and the answer was yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, John, yeah, DFS. We are short DFS, so I'm going to say that is the best looking stock I've ever seen, John, as far as a possible short. Absolutely. <laughs> now let's be. Now let me stop being silly. It is a little wide and loose. It is a little choppy. The uh, reason I like it so much, though, is if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, it, it, all that choppy just kind of goes away. And you can see this thing has been the mother of all uptrends, and then it's gone sideways for quite a while. So if this one begins to break down in earnest, then what's going to happen is it's going to be in a lot of trouble. And anyone who bought during this range up here is going to probably be looking to bail out at break even, okay. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna agree with you on that one, John. Uh, Ten thousand percent. Daryl wants to know about LYG twice, so let's uh, let's cover it. Um, it's it's a it, I think it's a foreign uh, uh, stock, so it does have some of these gaps in here. Uh, usually I don't like stocks that gap against the trend, but I'm gonna assume it's foreign, okay. And uh, you know it's kind of it's kind of plotted along in here, making new highs, and then it's kind of begun to accelerate, maybe on a little bit deeper pullback. Okay. Now he wants to know about it twice, so let's. Uh, okay. All right, you can see it's kind of worked its way higher in here. The more recent times, it's kind of accelerated higher. It is a foreign stock, so it does kind of gap against the trend, or it has some gaps in it. I wouldn't get too excited about it. Normally, I don't like a stock that gaps against the trend. Uh, maybe on a little bit deeper pullback. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, I said the same thing twice. For DFS, should one else consider how it is doing WRT, MA, and V? Uh, well, okay. As a general statement, you want to you want to have three things working for you. You want to have the market going in one direction. Let's just pick up for, for this or whatever. Let's say you want the market going up, you want the sectors going up, and you want individual stocks within the sectors going up. Sometimes with a transitional setup, like I said, you're a bit of a pioneer. You're fighting the overall market. So his question is, should we be looking at, at, at MasterCard or Visa or some of these other companies? And in this particular case, the answer is eh, no, uh, because you're looking for a – you're looking for a transitional play. In fact, if anything, it would almost be a contra type of deal where those companies are winning and DFS is losing type of situation, okay, with regard M, A, and B. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. Uh, you know, you don't throw everything out with the transitional setup, but you do make some exceptions to the rule. John wants to know about PKI. PKI. Uh, not bad. A little bit on the low volatility side, but not bad. It's broken out, you know, maybe a tiny bit deeper pullback. I'm kind of looking for perfection lately in the market. Um, I know you look at a stock like DFS and you don't, you know, well, that's kind of choppy, right? But I'm looking for, it's certain on the long side, at least, I'm looking for some sort of perfection in my setups because I'm a little I'm still nervous about the overall market. I don't like markets that are jerked around by events and are all excited and focused on events. I just like a longer term bull market where it goes up, pulls back, goes up, pulls back, rinse and repeat. I don't like a market that focuses on events, has a big rally or sell off on the events and then just dies out for a while. 
I don't like these V-shaped recoveries. It's very hard for me to do my market timing part of my job, okay? And if anything, the best thing I could tell you, and it's kind of cliche, is like, be careful, you know, because the market's overbought, because the VIX is very complacent, because volatility has compressed, now it's beginning to expand, but, you know, it's just a very tough market to trade. So in a case like that, I become very selective in the setups that I pick. And that's why I've picked some lower level speculative stocks. That's why I'm looking at a certain IPO right now. Stocks that can trade contra to the overall market, stocks that are more volatile in the overall market that can move more. And on the short side, I'm looking for those stocks at high levels that might be able to roll over. Okay, so for me to get excited about a generic long stock, something like a chemical or like this particular stock, a health service, or name any of the other stocks that are in these sectors that are in really nice uptrends, um, it's hard for me to get excited about those stocks unless they, they show me some, some perfection in, in the setup, and I have a really, really good look at setup. And, you know, the, the can't stand it test is something that, I really believe in at this juncture in the overall market. And years ago, I had, um, and I wrote about this in the first book. It's like I, I was, you know, I started going into a drawdown, and I was also working on a book at the same time, and I was real busy. And and it reached a point where it's like, you know what, I'm just going to back off on this trading, and, and I'm not doing, you know, I'm actually digging myself a deeper hole. And then what happened was. I reached a point where I couldn't stand not taking a trade, so I call it a can't stand it test. And I would, I would get in and take the trade, and I was too busy to micromanage it because I had all these other projects going on. And I did a lot better and stayed with the position a lot longer than would have if I would have just uh, went in and, and grabbed my quick profit and been happy with that. Okay, so right now I call it a can't stand it test. Right now is a market where I think you should only trade if you can't stand it. Okay. If you can't stand being out of the market because you think a position looks so great, a setup looks so great, then by all means take it. And that's why I'm looking for perfection so much in these charts in more recent time. And you probably heard hear me say this almost for like the last year or so. And that's because we've been in this choppy, tough market where we, we're not just a beautiful trend and not just pull back. I know I keep saying it, but it's like I'm dreaming, right? Pull back, I'm sorry, thrust, pull back, thrust, pull back, rinse and repeat. Okay, long-winded answer saying that. THC on a pullback? Probably. That's going to be another one of those uh, health services companies. Looks good. Um, I like a little bit deeper pullback, though. I mean, you had a little pullback here, and, you know, on a textbook basis, that's a pullback, right? But that's where I'm still looking for perfection, and, you know, maybe to the detriment of missing a few good stocks, but I'm willing to uh, forego them. But, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. Uh, you know, this will go on my momentum list if it's not already there. But I'm not going to run out and buy it until I get a good setup. Have gas long, G-A-S-S, G-A-S-S. -S. Okay, ah, it looks pretty good. The shipping stocks are looking pretty good in here. Uh, you know, the pullback wasn't enough for me, but, you know, I can't argue with your success. Very uh, thin, 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 thin stock. Nothing wrong with trading a thin stock, just know what you're up against, okay? And I've been doing some research lately on some micro-cap trading, and it's fairly interesting in that, uh, the, you know, you're dealing with a market inefficiency, but just remember that it's going to be very volatile and could get very dangerous when you're trading these uh, very, very low-cap uh, issues. So, But as long as you have a plan in place, then uh, by all means, eBay for Wilma. eBay's been looking pretty good. The thing about eBay is eBay is more of a what I call a Darvis type of stock. It just keeps building these boxes and not really setting up. Okay, it, it, it a box on top of a box. Okay, so yeah, it looks okay, and it's making new highs in here. And uh, somebody was making a fundamental argument for them uh, eBay yesterday, which I can't completely ignore, um, and it looks okay. They were they were basing it on the fact that they own PayPal and PayPal is becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, but it's hard for me to get on a stock like this because it doesn't fully adhere to my methodology. It's really choppy, but then it's chopped its way higher. 
So you almost have to take that Nicholas Darvis approach and say, well, it's traded between whatever the box is, 40 and 42. When it gets above uh, 42, then I might buy it, you know, and, and, and then uh, it trades between the box between 46 and 50. Well, I'm going to put the stop, you know, somewhere below the box or at the prior box. It traded on kind of like a box style. Darvish wrote, I got it here somewhere, how I made $2 million in the stock market. I think that's it. Uh, good book to read. Good sort of intro on technical analysis. From from He, uh, he stumbled across uh, his little methodology, which is kind of cool, but uh, definitely worth reading. Uh, but, you know, my methodology doesn't fit every single stock, okay? But this is what I would call a Darvish stock. It, it kind of moves in boxes. By the way, if you had a, a way to identify these Darvis stocks and you made that your niche or niche, however you want to say it, I'm friends with a biologist who's, who's got a PhD. Actually, I have two friends that are biologists. No, now that I'm thinking about it, I'll, I'll ask them if it's niche or niche. But uh, let's just use niche because that's more common. If that becomes your niche, then by all means, find a way to identify these Darvis stocks and trade them, okay? Uh, stocks that make boxes on top of boxes, and, and nothing wrong with that. It's certainly, I'm not going to argue with it because it's certainly conceptually correct. Over the years, I've found some patterns that I really like to trade uh, that are mostly pullback related, as you know. But if if you could find, figure it out, figure out a way to find these little Darvis stocks and trade these boxes and are very patient, then uh, there's nothing wrong with that. All right, John found an aluminum name, JJU. He says it's not liquid. Well, let's see. JJU. Whoa, that's not liquid at all. <laughs> it's also a bit of electrocardiogram, okay? It's up, it's down, it's up. You have no structure there, John, so don't don't trade that. Okay, Eric says this is great advice. The majority only take positions after a good market move. Won't you be uh, looking when things don't feel so good? Actually, Darvis stocks can be trading with your pullback methodology. Oh, cool. All right. Well, that's that's great. So me and Mr. Darvis agree. Okay. Uh, we're pretty much at the edge of um, recording limitations. Anybody, uh, any last questions? Anybody want to get anything real quick? We'll do a lightning round if possible. While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. As I say over and over and over again, I love doing these shows. I have a blast doing them. I learned a ton from you. It's fodder for research for me. Hopefully, I provided some fodder for research for you, too. Um, and please uh, share that with me, provided you want to share it with everyone else. If you don't, just let me know. We'll uh, keep between us um, either way. But uh, I have a great time doing these. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I guess we'll talk again uh, next Thursday, if not sooner. Everybody, uh, if we don't uh, talk between now and then, have a great Weekend, as usual, anything unanswered, shoot me an email. Okay? Thanks again. See you guys next week.